Hello and welcome to your webinar. This is the webinar for transitioning from a student nurse to a newly registered nurse. Um, my name is Alex Drake. I'm one of the leads for the NRM network um, and I'll just let the team introduce themselves. So I'll hand over to Daniel first. Hi everyone, my name is Daniel Branch. I'm also one of the co-leads for the newly registered nurses network. Nice to see everyone. Hi, I'm Lisa. I'm also a co-lead with the newly registered nurses network and I'll pass you on to Sam. I'm a curator on the network. I'm a newly qualified nurse who will be talking about speaking up and raising concerns in the workplace. Hi everyone, my name's Claire. I'm a registered nurse uh, and lecturer and I'm here to talk about transitioning <laughs> from student to registered nurse. So the aim of this webinar is to support the transition from student nurse to newly registered nurse. So the content you'll see throughout will be life as an NRN and preceptorship, speaking up and moving to a new trust, um, different routes of nursing, There'll be a Q&A session where you can ask us all your burning questions about being an NRN um, and then a little bit about well-being and mental health and financial support. So this is life as an NRN or my life as an NRN. Um, it is tough. It was overwhelming. Um, I honestly don't think anything prepared me for it, um, no matter how much time at uni we spent. <laughs> um, just remember that it is OK not to be OK, though, and to reach out to your team for support. Um, you will have your supernumerary period, which when you first start, I think it does vary between trusts. But personally, for me, mine was three weeks and I think our ICUs were three months. Um, but the framework itself does recommend a minimum of two weeks, so you should get at least two weeks supernumerary um, period. Um, you should then have your first preceptorship meeting within the first two weeks of starting um, and then a minimum of a further two meetings and an interim meeting halfway through just to see how you're getting on, making sure you're OK, checking in with you um, and then a final sign off meeting, which will be the end of your probation period. So life is an RN. You will have come across these skills anyway as a student, but you then have to re-sign them off and become competent again in them. Um, so for me personally, I've had to become competent in oral meds, so I had to do this by the time I was out of supernumerary period. My IVs were six months, um, bloods from the line were six months, central line dressings were six months, um, blood transfusion and for us personally, uh, TPN is a year. Um, you can also go on bespoke study days. So like for me personally, I did a critical care course um, because we have patients that have like repogals and things like that. Um, but other trusts may vary. You may have cannulation in your trust or catheter insertion. We don't have to do that. Our doctors actually do that for us. Um, but I do know that other trusts may, may have you do that. Um, and just also, if you go to our RCN NRM website, you can find the NRN handbook, which has helpful hints and tips about everything as life as an NRN. Um, so me, myself, I work at Great Ormond Street. Um, I am on a surgical ward for neonates and peds up to 18 years old. Um, and that can be absolutely manic at times. <laughs> um, yeah, some days are busy, some days it's not too bad. Um, but yeah, it has been quite the journey so far. Um, OK, so next we're going to be talking about preceptorship, which hopefully is going to be a big part of your first experience as a newly registered nurse. Um, so we do have the link there for the NMC guidance and standards for preceptorship, which is obviously useful to look at. And as Alex said, there are also lots of useful tips in the handbook. So what we're talking about, what is preceptorship? So the main aim of the preceptorship is to help to welcome newly registered nurses and integrate them into the new team workplace that they're joining. Because obviously if you're joining a new place, there's lots of new bits, aren't there? New faces, you know, how do you open doors? Where are things kept? All of those things take a bit of time to get used to. So you need to have a bit of time for that. Um, it also helps professionals to translate their knowledge into everyday practice. So obviously, as a student, you've been doing lots of theory. You have had some time on practice doing different placements, depending on what you're doing. But obviously, actually being at your new job and your experience, so there's time allowed for doing that. And also, it gets you used to the idea of applying the NMC code 
into your day to day life. You know, as a newly registered nurse, suddenly you suddenly have your full responsibility under the code, which is obviously nothing to worry about because I'm sure you're doing good practice anyway, but it does take a bit of getting used to. Um, so all the newly registered nurses should receive a preceptorship during their first year once qualified. Um, now, in my case, I was lucky to have um, 12 months before I kind of got everything signed off, but there can be differences um, in time for that. I know some people can have six months, three months, you know, but it's important to know what is at your trust. So it's a good question to be asking what you should be having. As we said, we know that uh, and everyone's become accountable as soon as they're registered with the NMC in this transition period can be difficult uh, and overwhelming. In order to reduce the variation of programmes, we will come on in a minute to talk about the fact that Health Education England have introduced a framework. Um, I personally work for Lancaster and South Cumbria NHS uh, Foundation Trust as part of their incentive support team for people with learning disabilities. So um, my perceptorship period, as I said, was a year because I started in the community. It's maybe slightly different to what Alex was talking about, but still the same idea of acquiring different skills that you'd need day to day, having a chance to practice doing them, going to see patients in my case. So initially doing visits with other people, then doing visits by myself and things like that, learning how to do different assessments and forms. And also in the case of my trust, my trust had a workbook that we worked through and we had some different specific training sessions um, that we were talking about. So there were um, all sorts of good opportunities there. But it's going to be important when you're at your trust or even if you're doing a new trust, one of the good things that you can be asking about even an interview is kind of you know what is the perceptorship like what are the opportunities going to be and that can hopefully help you make a decision so as i said in order to try and standardize what can be a pretty overwhelming experience health education england have tried to come up with this framework um for a natural so this is the national perceptorship framework for england and um, caroline is going to be popping some links in a bit about the fact that i know we have probably some people watching from Wales and Scotland or Ireland they do have slight differences but fundamentally uh, the ideas are the same so as you can see on the slide in many ways it's kind of similar to things you've had when you've been on your placements as a student there are different areas that you're trying to uh, demonstrate that you're able to do things like clinical practice so delivering person-centered and safe care communication being able to talk to people working as part of a team leadership I think all of which is part of your Kind of sign off stuff when you're a student isn't it and also um some maybe work specific stuff so professionalism and integrity research and evidence safety and quality facilitation and learning i'm not going to read through all of that because that will be uh, a lot of listening for you to be doing but essentially it means that you should have the chance to develop a broad range of skills as part of your perceptorship they're going to put you in a much stronger position uh, to be a good new resident nurse going forward and a good nurse going forward. And I'm passing over to Leanne. Um, so as I'm going through these slides, um, I've put up some questions on here that I just want you guys to think about. It might help you form any questions that you would like to ask me. Um, so what are the positives, what are the negatives, and if there are any consequences that you can think of of maybe speaking out? Um, for I myself, um, well, I was a newly qualified nurse who, like all of us, were really excited and really optimistic about starting um, my career in a and &E. um, And then I encountered the issues that made me think kind of twice about not only where I was working, but what I was doing about that as well. Um, and so I chose to speak up and I'll go into that a little bit in more detail. So there are loads of people um, who can actually help through it. Um, you know, there were several issues that I raised. Um, so if I give you a little bit of a backstory, um, I first started as a newly qualified nurse um, as an emergency trauma nurse um, in a busy paediatric um, a &E. um, And as you can imagine, that was very hectic all of the time. And I loved the speciality. However, I noticed very quickly on that there wasn't a lot of support around. Um, I noticed this when I found myself as the second named nurse of an unsuccessful resus. Um, and I found myself noticing that actually I was still in my supernumerary time. And then that got me thinking about actually the fact that supernumerary time is supposed to be protected. Um, it's there to protect you. Um, you know, you're there to get that introduction into where you're working um, and to kind of build up then um like you know just build up them bonds really 
um, none of which that I got. And that was my first inkling that something was wrong. Um, and so I spoke to several other colleagues of mine. They were the first person who I reached out to. And actually, I found out that a lot of my other colleagues felt the same, that when they first joined, they didn't have a, any support for them. Um, they didn't really get any protected supernumerary time. Um, and as a result, I knew that this was something that I needed to speak up about. Um, you know, and that is definitely something that I would urge anyone who found that to do as well. Um, so there are loads of people who can help, you know, you are not alone through it, although it will be one of the loneliest times you will ever encounter. Um, I had loads of support around me um, from numerous people, but still I felt like there was no one who was with me at all. Um, but that support does come from all angles and from all places. Um, you know, there are loads of people who can help you, um, including your colleagues, like I just mentioned, your family and your friends. Um, you know, certainly for me, I know that my partner who I live with was my biggest support when going through this. You know, he was the one who saw me day in, day out, like when I come in through, like coming back from work, going to work, um, you know, and he really saw that behind side of me of that, you know, I put on a brave face every time I was at work, but actually, these were the issues that were really affecting me. Um, you know, going back to work, there are other people who can help, such as, you know, your line manager, although just be mindful about who it is and what the issue is that you're raising. Um, so think about who that appropriate person is. Um, for me, it wasn't appropriate for me to go to my line manager because um, my lack of support actually came from the fact that she was supposed to be my preceptorship buddy and I'd had no support at all from her. So I actually went above her and went straight to the matrons. Um, but you've got, you know, your line manager or your other colleagues. Um, you know, you might find that actually it's appropriate for you to talk to a senior band six um, or, you know, whoever really. But you do have other people as well um, that aren't just going to be on your ward or your area. You know, you've got HR who you can get involved. I certainly know I got involved with HR for my case. Um, I reached out to the chief of nursing who again you can get hold of in your trust and again they are really good people to try and help you um, get hold of your union so I informed the RCN that I was going through some of these issues and as a result I was able to get support from them as well um, and lastly your freedom to speak up um, these are you should have in every trust your freedom to speak up champions these are dedicated people who might just have their own office. For me, I was lucky that I had freedom to speak up champions in my department. So I spoke to them directly, you know, coming from an A&E perspective and they were really helpful. Um, so even though it is really lonely and it is really harsh, like you will get through it. Just know who you're reaching out to and keep them people there, even if when they say to you, can I help? And you think that they can't like just say that you really appreciate them because actually you know that will do you a lot of good as well as them so i've just got this quote here which i came across when i was kind of really at the despair of going through um speaking up and raising concerns which is the problem doesn't see what the problem is because they are the problem and I came across that quote when I realised that I couldn't speak to my line manager. Everyone's told me, oh, yeah, go talk to your line manager. Like, you know, your band seven line manager is there to help you. Um, and I actually realised that every conversation that I had with my line manager about kind of support or um, introducing newly qualifiers into the department in a different way, she didn't want to listen to me. Um, and so, you know, just keep that in mind. Um, you may be feel, but maybe made to feel like you're being blamed for the issues you are raising. Um, you are not to blame. This isn't your fault. Um, you know, there are times when it will seem impossible and it will seem like perhaps it would be easier if you didn't raise the issues. But then for me, it always felt like if I didn't raise the issue, then I wouldn't know, I wouldn't be solving that for anyone. I would be letting other nurses who followed in my footsteps go through the same issues. And that's what I didn't want. Um, so, you know, my advice would be to kind of deal with any issues that you have. 
if you haven't already find another job you know I certainly did that it might not be with a different trust it might just be a different ward for me I left the trust completely I went and worked um in you know a trust much closer to home um and I found that actually that trust was a lot better for me and supported me a lot better um you know my bottom line is this speaking up is hard and it's messy and it takes a lot of guts to do it but that's where your support comes in that I spoke about you know that's about reaching out to the people who you know are there who want to take care of you you know they will be what gets you through it um and then like me when you're on the other side of it you can look back at it and say hell yeah I made it through that you know and for me that very moment was when everything about why I became a nurse in the first place made sense to me that is why I did it um, and I certainly know that even though I've left that trust now um, I can look back and know that I've left things in place so that other newly qualified shouldn't have the same experience as what I did um, thank you I think I'm now passing on to Claire um, so yeah, so uh, just going back uh, to what Alex was saying at the start about that transition period from student nurse um, to newly qualified nurse, it, well, or newly registered nurse, sorry, um, is by far the hardest part, I think. Uh, maybe not for everyone, but for me personally, it was by far the hardest part of all of my journey. Um, so after university, uh, I went straight into GP nursing um, and the first clinic I worked at, so I moved down, I qualified in Birmingham, I moved down to Portsmouth, so I was in a new place, I had no friends, which didn't help. Um, and I was put in this clinic with no support and I didn't realise that I didn't have the support at the time, if that makes sense. I just thought this was normal for GP. Um, so I went into this new clinic and um, I was put on the fundamentals of general practice nursing course. Some places it's called foundations of general practice nursing course, um, but it doesn't matter anyway. I was put on this course uh, and that was classed as your preceptorship uh, in GP. So you had a two year support. So the first year was the, the foundations course or the fundamentals course um, where you learn all your different skills, your um, cervical screening, how to do proper ECGs, uh, wound care, uh, baby immunizations and vaccinations, uh, history taking because it's a lot of history taking, health promotion as well in GP, um, loads of different things anyway, all the skills you need to be a GP nurse, um, you go through that. Um, and that was quite nice because you had a group of people that were all in the same boat, they were all new to GP. Um, so it was nice to bounce off each other and say, I'm feeling really, lonely i'm feeling like i've got no support is this normal and so that was the nice part of that course is because you could all relate and we had a whatsapp group so we could bounce off each other and explain our worries and our concerns um and then yeah so part of the two-year program so once you've done a year of the course you still had that extra year um where the queen's nursing institute so you'd had like a mentor from the queen's nursing institute that would come and they would support you they'd be your mentor through it um and you're supposed to have a mentor in your practice as well uh however i did have a mentor um but i i didn't meet with my mentor Actually, I met her once in the eight months that I was there um, and you were supposed to have supervisions and you were supposed to have, um, I don't know, every month, I think, um, supervision. You were supposed to work together. They were supposed to come and observe you to make sure you're doing everything right. Um, and I was just sort of thrown in and left to do what I could do. So because I'd had a GP placement, I was familiar with the EMIS system that they used there. So I was quite confident in that. So I didn't really need much with that. I could do wounds because my last uh, management placement was community and that's all I did was wound care. So I was quite familiar with wounds and things like that. Um, I could do ECGs because that's something again I did as a student nurse. I was trained to do that. Um, injections, I was trained to do injections, so I was stuck doing those things over and over again and not learning any new skills. Um, but because I just did that, um, I think they just expected that from me. 
Um, and part of that was my own fault. I didn't speak up. Going back to what Liam was saying about speaking up, I personally didn't really speak up. I just thought, well, this is OK. You know, I'm doing these skills. It's This is how it's supposed to be. Um, and I kept speaking to people like other nurses and they were saying, don't worry, it feels like this at the start. It feels very hard and it feels um, tough and that imposter syndrome is very real. Just wait about six months to a year and you'll settle in. So I was like, OK, just give it time, give it time. So I plodded along, just doing the same things and keep kept going. Um, and then the eight months came and I thought, it got to the point where I thought I've never been supervised. I've ne I don't know if what I'm doing is right, even though I've had the training and I'm confident in what I'm doing. But it was that I want someone to watch me and ask me questions to, to know that I'm doing it OK. And it got to the point where I was terrified because I felt unsafe. And I thought if something goes wrong and this I'm up at the NMC court for whatever reason and my pins in question, I can't justify anything because I haven't spoke up. Um, I have never had supervision, um, so I blamed myself a lot for it. And in the end, I left the clinic uh, and I thought, you know what? I, I don't feel safe. I need a different clinic. And I moved to another clinic that was just down the road from my house. And oh my God, uh, what a difference that made. Like Liam was saying about moving, don't be afraid to move if you're not happy and you're not getting the support, because that was by far the best thing that I ever did. Um, the team was were amazing. I had a whole two weeks of shadowing the nurse there and then she come and watched me and they were so lovely and just so supportive. Um, it was a whole different place and I was like, oh my God, this is how it's supposed to be. You're supposed to have the support in place. You're supposed to have the mentors. You're supposed to have people signing off your books and things. I didn't have that before, but I didn't realise until you're there and getting the support. And you think, oh my God, that first clinic was really bad. Um, but I did mention it to, um, I won't mention names, but she, she was like one of the CCG people for the area. Um, and I did mention because she sent me an email to say how are you getting on and things like that. And I updated her and said, I don't think that's the place to put students or newly qualified nurses because the support's just not great. Um, so I'm hoping they're going to do something. I don't know. Um, but yeah, but that transition period, that first year, I want to say, it was the hard. I used to go home crying every night and thinking, what have I done? What have I done? Have I made the right choice? Should I be a nurse? Am I supposed to feel this way? It was horrible. It got to the point, actually, I went to the doctor and they were giving me CBT for anxiety and stuff because it just got that bad. Um, not to scare anybody on the webinar that's newly qualified or coming up to qualifying. Um, but just to say that that transition period can be hard. Um, and I think when people say, oh, just put up with it, you should be feeling like this for six months. I don't think you should be feeling that bad, <laughs> to be honest. Um, so just, yeah, my advice for that would just be if you're not happy, you're not getting the support, find somewhere else, get the support, because that is the biggest tip, I think, out of everything um, that, that helped me. Just having that new clinic support was just a whole different game changer for me. Um, but yeah, I had a rough time with my transition period. It's by far the hardest part of my whole journey throughout nursing. I would have taken an exam. I would have taken my dissertation back <laughs> over all of that because it wasn't nice. Um, and I tried to be positive. I was always posting on socials like, oh, yeah, I'm doing this. I'm doing this. It's great. But inside, I was like, I don't know if I'm doing this right. I don't know if this is good. It's really bad, actually. Um, so, yeah, so just thinking about my journey, uh, if we think back to the Mar Maslow's hierarchy need of needs, I'm assuming everyone knows this. Um, I mean, I'd moved, like I said, I'd moved area, so I've been completely removed from all of my friends, family. So that um, sense of, I suppose, belonging and that safety element from for me was removed. Um, and then that workplace and having the lack of support and everything, that was another area that was removed from me. So it's no wonder like my mental health just completely dipped with that because so much was affecting it. Um, but just some advice for other people. Um, if, if you do go through this, uh, one imposter syndrome is real. Um, I'm having it again now. I've got a new job now because I'm doing my lecturing now and I'm thinking, oh my God, how did I become a lecturer? <laughs> I'm not smart enough for this, but luckily I've got a really supportive place and everyone's lovely. Um, but imposter syndrome is real. You will go into your um, workplace as a newly registered nurse and you'll be thinking, 
I don't know why I'm here. I don't know how I got here. Um, it's 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 normal to feel like that, but don't let it consume you. Don't don't let it get that bad that it's affecting your mental health. Make sure you get the support and the help and speak to people um, th that understand what it's like to be a nurse and go through all this as well, because that's a massive, a massive help, I think. Um, and never forget, it's OK not to know something. That's something that I beat myself up. I'll never forget doing one of my first clinics on my own and the patient come in and they questioned their blood results. It was something really, really simple, but at the time I just didn't know the answer to it. Um, and I beat myself up for weeks over it, just thinking, oh my God, I should know this. Why don't I know this question? I've just been at uni for three years. We've done blood works. Why haven't I done it? Why can't I remember anything? Um, and I just beat myself up so much, but you have to remind yourself it's OK not to know something like nursing is massive. You can not physically know it all. And the day that you think you know it all is probably the day you should <laughs> give up nursing, maybe because it's impossible. We can't know it all. There's so many specialities, so many conditions, rare conditions um, and your patients will absolutely welcome the fact of you saying, I'm really sorry, I don't actually know the answer to that, but I'll find out or help you. They'd rather you be honest than try and fob them off with some rubbish and then you get caught out and then it's a whole <laughs> spiral. Luckily, I didn't do that. It was, it was OK. I did tell them I've got no idea. I will look it up, though. Um, and then again, at number three, uni only prepares you for so much. So you've got your three years at uni. That is just literally giving you the foundations of what a nurse is what you are, uh, your clinical skills, giving you that. I don't want to say basic, but there's nothing basic about uh, nursing, but that foundation of being a nurse, that's all uni prepares you for. It doesn't prepare you for the real life. Um, well, placements, obviously, but the rest you, you sort of learn on the job. You can only sort of learn so much at uni. The rest is going to come when you're a qualified nurse out there in clinics, practicing. Um, you're going to keep training, keep learning um, because there's so many different specialities, like I was saying, different learning packages that you'll be putting on. Um, just making sure that you're up to date with all your learning needs as well as you go, just to keep your knowledge refreshed. And um, it can be hard because there's so much out there, but it, like I said, just don't beat yourself up if you don't know, because you're going to be learning all the time, every day. <laughs> um, and get the support. Like I said, um, get the support. If you haven't got the support, go elsewhere. Um, speak up, obviously. If, if you can speak up, you feel comfortable to speak up, speak up. Because um, that's maybe places just don't know that they're bad at supporting people. Um, and it might just take somebody to say, do you know what? This is really bad. Could we put something in place? Um, and they might just put something in place. Um, but if you are asking for the support and they're not giving you anything and you've finished battling them, um, don't be afraid to jump ship and find someone that will support you. Um, and remember, you can do this. <laughs> you know, forget the imposter drone. You can do this. You pass the course. You, you're completely qualified to do this. Uh, you can do it. You just need to remind yourself of that and give yourself a little ego boost in the morning before you leave the door. Sometimes do your Wonder Woman or um, Superman pose, whatever one you want to do, and just say, yeah, I've got this. So I'm going to smash it today. <laughs> Hopefully that will help. <laughs> Um, I think that's it. I think that's all I've got from me. Uh, am I passing over to Lisa now? Um, any questions, I'll just pop them, pop them in the chat or whatever. Yeah, so you've passed over to me. Um, my name's Lisa. Um, I actually work for Imperial Healthcare um, in ITU, although I'm about to change jobs. Like everyone's been saying, if you're afraid and you don't want to be somewhere, do it. I'm on my third job and it's my, I've only been a qualified year. Don't settle for anything less than. Um, so I'll be moving to hospice next. Um, so the way I think we're going to be working the Q&A section is um, Sam is going to get the questions. And I think kind of between us, we're going to kind of structure it in a way that it's going to be said to me, Claire and Leanne, depending on what type of questions it is. And feel free to put some in there. Ask all the questions you've always wanted to ask somebody to people who've really recently been through it. It's, it's probably your best opportunity to get it. So I'll pass it over to Sam. Hey guys, um, I'm Sam. I'm actually a student nurse myself. So um, that's why I'm asking the questions because I have some of my own too. So I'm sure together we can ask quite a few. 
um, and this is your audience to ask. So um, please feel free to put them in the in the Q&A and we will sort through them. Um, we do already have some questions. So um, the first one uh, was how how long is supposed to be your supernumerary status? Right, so I know we went over this one already. So the recommended minimum is about 75 hours, which works out roughly to two weeks. However, it does vary on where you are. I know that Alex was saying that um, in the ITU there, they had three months. Um, when I went to the community, I had two weeks initially because I went district nursing as my first job. I had two weeks. Then I had a meeting with my manager and the education. I thought, do you know what? I'm still not quite ready. So they gave me a further two weeks. So I got four weeks supernumerary. Although in the community, I find that supernumerary is a, an interesting way to put it is because at some point you will be going out to give insulin and it's not really great to have everyone coming to do those insulins. Um, so I'd be doing insulin, but I'd still go on other visits with other people. So that's how that worked. And I've moved to ITU since and I had 10 weeks of supernumerary um, shifts. Then I had a further four weeks of supported shifts, although the ITU where I am, I find they still support you, even though you've probably gone into numbers at that point with those supported shifts um, for a lot longer. Um, so it really does vary. That's one of the questions you should really ask on your interview, actually. That's one of the, I think that's the main question I've asked every single person I've ever interviewed for. Um, I accept the hospice one, I actually did forget to ask that question. But to be fair, I'm a year qualified now, so preceptorship isn't my main goal now. It's more about how are they going to educate me more than what's your preceptorship like. So you'll find your education question will change as you go. Did anyone else want to share any light or is that cool to move on? I think you summed it up really nicely, Lisa. Um, there is loads coming through, which I'm just trying to make sure that I'm reading the right ones in the right order. There was a question about um, ITU and Lisa, as you have been discussing, and I know Alex, you also work in a intensive area. Um, so the question was, uh, if I can find it really quickly, is do you recommend um, ICU for a newly qualified nurse? Alex, do you want to take it first and then I will answer because I went six months after. So, I mean, I'd say if it's something you're passionate in and it's an area you enjoy, go for it. There's, there's no reason not to. Um, and like you said, what's the worst that can happen if you don't enjoy it? You can transfer, you can move. Yeah, but, I agree, Alex. yeah if you want to do it, do it. So like I said, I went from district nursing to ICU. Um, my experience has been slightly different. I decided I'd do it because I wanted to push my, myself out of my comfort zone because I got really comfortable in community. And I thought, you know what? If I don't leave here, I'm never going to go to a hospital ever. Um, so I would recommend it if that is what you're interested in. If you are not interested in it, don't go there. If someone's told you, oh, this area is so great, you should start off here. As you know, it's probably during your training. All of those three years, someone's going, oh, start off on the wards, blah, blah, blah. You do not have to start off there. I mean, I've started off it, now. It'll be my third area where they don't recommend newly qualified to go to. And I feel like I just put my middle finger up at it all and go, I'm going to do what I like, basically. So, yeah, if you feel like that is the area for you, like Alex said, yeah, go for it. But if you don't, don't follow what people say. But it, it, they give you a bit more education and support in there. So you don't just go in there and they don't just throw you in or anything. So don't worry too much about that. And Leanne, I know that um, you obviously started off in A&E, which is another place that um, we are often told not to start in. And I know that your experience wasn't um, ideal for your first one, but um, maybe you can share some light on your opinion on this as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, likewise, I always got told, don't go to A&E as a newly qualified, you know, start on a ward, start on a generic ward like at that. And it was a case of, for me, I absolutely hated generic ward nursing. I knew straight away from year one of being a student nurse, so that's not what I wanted to do. Um, and actually I got, uh, my first a &E placement was in year two, and I knew from that moment in time that that's where I wanted to go as a newly qualified. So, you know, like Lisa said, like, you know, don't be afraid to go for whatever that area is that you are interested in, even if everyone tells you don't go there. If that's what you want to do, go. Um, you know, like I said, I 
So I also moved areas. So a little bit like what Claire was talking about, about, you know, the kind of like that imposter syndrome of, you know, moving areas, going to a new trust. Um, you know, I felt all of them feelings. But for me, because I knew I wanted to do a &E, I chose an area close to where I live. Uh, which had like a major trauma centre and I thought oh yeah that'd be great to get any experience going there as like a trauma nurse um, and it was you know I learned so many skills like you know I would talk to my peers from college like from college from uni and things like that about when they started in their different areas and I found out that actually we were learning completely different skills because obviously we were all in completely different areas um, so yeah I think from from a skills point of view I absolutely loved a &E nursing you know I do think you get an awful lot of skills which I was keen to get especially you know being first like newly qualified um but yeah don't be afraid to to move ship like I said and like you know Lisa and Alex have said and so is Claire like you know it is easy to move I stayed there for four or five months um and in that four or five months um, there were two other newly qualified nurses who started at the same time as me and all three of us left for exactly the same reason, which was lack of support. Um, I was the only one who spoke up about it, um, but as a result, you know, um, I know since they've left, they've then got in contact back with other people to that trust um, to kind of say that actually, yeah, that they didn't feel well supported. So. Um, yeah, again, even though, you know, my experience wasn't great. I mean, I, I now work on like a paediatric assessment unit and emergency observation. So I work on them. Um, it's like a little bit of an in-between ward slash a &E. Um, So we kind of, we take referrals straight from like the GP, the health visitor and um, things like that. So they don't have to sit in a &E for hours. Um, and so that's like the emergency observation bits of that side of things. Um, and then we also are a day um, observation unit. So all of our regular kids that have things like chemo um, and other kinds of infusions, we will do all that as well. So we're not taking up beds on the ward, um, but we're also not leaving them in a &E for hours. So um, I kind of, for me, I moved to, like I said, I got so much more support, you know, like, like Claire, the minute I moved to my new trust, I got, you know, everything that I was expecting to get as a newly qualified um you know and I've been now been there kind of like what three months um and I absolutely love it you know they've been so supportive um you know I kind of showed them my my perceptionship book and kind of the fact that nothing had been filled in because they hadn't got that support and immediately you know my clinical facilitator kind of sat me down and was like that's not a problem you've got the skills we'll just go through it and a plan was made there and then you know, so I still went into, I still moved because I knew that I liked the speciality and I didn't want to move completely. Um, and so, yeah, I went to a very similar area and I still got that support, you know. So just because an area is known to be busy or manic or, you know, lots going on, it doesn't mean that the support won't be there. You just need to find that right trust for you. Thank you, Leanne. Um, one question that I am trying to find again is about when is the right time to join the RCN? Um, and I'm just going to start that off as a student. Um, now is my answer. Um, I have personally, I've been a member of the RCN as a support worker as well. So I um, changed my membership into student as I became a student. And um, there is no better time than now. It's a union and a professional body. So um, definitely get on board with that. Obviously, you have to pay for membership, but there are so many benefits to it. Um, and it is a union and we are trying to get people for just a little side note there to get your vote in as soon as possible. So I'll pass that over real quick to the members as well. Yeah, I agree with Sam. It's um, the best time as a student and I'm pretty sure it's a discounted cost as well for your three years and your first one after you've qualified too. So it's, it's well worth it. You get access to the library. There's so many benefits. I'd go for it, but I feel like the website would explain it way better than I would. Can I add something really, really quick? I'll be speedy. Another perk of RCN is they've got the RCN careers team that will help you with CV writing, which is the something that I use to get into my GP practice. So use and abuse it. Okay. Not to claim to be an expert, but there's some tax rebates on it as well. So it does cost money, but you can claim some of it back in the end as well. So. Okay, guys. Um, so the next one I'm going to ask um, is 
Yeah, uh, really important actually because it's something that's ongoing and as we're talking about unions as well um, it's all kind of tied nicely is how have the staff shortages affected the process of transitioning and gaining confidence in supervising students this person has been told that they uh, by the time their class graduates they will be assigned a student from any year which sounds really scary to them because they will be starting the process of becoming accountable as a nurse and then be responsible for another person's professional development, not mentioning patient safety. And I'm sure many of you want to speak on that, so um, feel free to go at it. Um, I'll, I'll take it first and if anyone wants to jump in after me, go for it. Um, the staff shortages have really affected the transition. I mean, from all of the jobs that I've done so far, um, in district nursing, my team was very short staffed, so I found um, not that I was pushed in any way because they let me have that extra time when I asked for it to be supernumerary, but it did feel like sometimes I, I had to stop what I was learning, um, leave the more complex stuff to people more senior and just make sure we could get all things done. Um, and in ITU, I found that I would always be on a supernumerary, sh supernumerary shift with doubles, um, which is when a nurse is one to two. So really, I was looking after a, maybe a lower level patient, not strictly by myself, but they were next to me. But sometimes I felt like that would impact because I found that the days we had the doubles in my supernumerary period, it, it just felt like it was probably worse than the days when we were focused, we had a level three patient and it was just one of us and me on the side helping. So yeah, it, it has been affecting that. And um, yeah, you can, I don't think you'll, you'll be assigned a student from any year straight off the bat. I think they would, I'd like to think your trust wherever you end up would be appropriate with that. I didn't get a student until months in and it, it wasn't that I was their student. I didn't have to sign anything off. They were just with me for the day. So you can always express that to your manager, to the, sh the person who's in charge of the shift. Um, that, do you know what, I don't feel like I'm quite ready for a student yet. But I find that once you get a student, doesn't matter what year, you kind of realise what you do know. I, I was scared to have mine for the day with me and I only had it for a few hours because we were community. And um, if you know, if you go to community, you tend to get sent home at two. Um, so yeah, you, you don't be so nervous, but if you are, just make sure you tell somebody. Anyone else want to jump in? I will quickly second that I didn't have a student work with me until probably after Christmas and I qualified or started in the October last year. Um, but on top of that, um, in my second year as such, perceptualist programmes when we do our assessor course, so I won't actually ha be a mentor or assessor for anyone until I've done that. So you'll work with them, but you probably won't be mentoring them. Thanks, guys. Um, sorry, my Q&A has just disappeared. Um, it's disappeared, but I can remember one of the questions that I really wanted to ask you all. Um, Alex, I might send this over to you, actually. Um, is Can you please discuss a positive experience of being a newly registered nurse? I mean, mine hasn't been that bad. <laughs> I won't lie. Um, I had really good education team on my ward that um, worked with me a lot. They did shifts with me. They weren't like my buddy as such. They were just there in case it was too busy and I needed help. Um, things I could pass on to them because obviously at that point I wasn't taking students or HAs or anything like that. Um, they were really good with my IVs. We pushed it back slightly because the trust standard was six months, but I just didn't feel ready um, and things like that. So the actual experience itself has been great. The team were lovely, so I can't really complain about anything like that. Um, it has been fine and it will be fine. You just, it does happen. You will get a rough period, but for the most part, it's absolutely fine. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. Does it, if anyone else wants to share positivity as well, that's great as well. Daniel, you look like you want to speak, so go ahead. Yeah, no, just to to back up what Alex has said obviously we've all talked about the fact that it can be stressful and it can but I'm sure any job can but you know the good bits I think are making a difference for people that you know you can obviously we're all doing different fields and different things but in some way you know over a period of time you are hopefully making people better and that is you know massively rewarding when you're seeing that and you will be seeing that as an university nurse as you probably did as a student and as you carry on hopefully. There's a few similar questions um 
about the preceptorship and about skills. So I'm going to try and, if it's okay with the listeners and the attendees, I'm going to try and bunch them to them a few questions together, which is about um, proficiency skills um, around the preceptorship period, like what sort of pr proficiencies and skills. Um, and also in relation to that, if you haven't practiced them skills uh, as a student for a long period of time, um, how do you feel about that transition period in terms of your training in them skills? I'll go really quick. <laughs> um, I had a separate workbook for my capital nurse IV stuff and a separate workbook for non IV related stuff. So all my oral meds, blood transfusions, line dressings, um, everything like that, taking blood from a central line. They were all in this book and I'd have to, I could do as many practices as I wanted with the education team. Um, and then in the book, I do three like proper practices um, where they would sign it off. So you will get time to do it all before you actually become competent in it. Um, I have my step one um, critical care competency, which won't be finished by the time I leave. And I'm not too bothered about that because I'm I'm going and I'm happy about it. So um, I had that, which was generally it, it split up into body systems and, and how we were deal, dealing with things. Then I had some trust ones, which were I think blood competency and NG. I hadn't done an NG as a student. I must have locked out somehow because I didn't have gastro. I didn't have any placements where I needed to have it done. So and I still haven't done one to this day. Um, but NG feeds and setting that up I did once or twice this student but again that's what your supernumerary period is for if you're on a place where they're doing those things um you can do them but if you still don't know and you're out of your supernumerary period you still are expected to be saying to somebody hold on a minute I actually don't know how to do that because that is in the NMC code if you don't know something you need to say something about it it's about you know being honest and you know you, you you don't want to be trying to do something you don't know and then messing up and being like, oh, God, I've, I've done something that's damaged somebody. So you will never be expected to do something you don't know. And if someone does, that is when you tell them, hold on a minute. No, I'm not going to do that. And then you can actually escalate it to a senior. Or if it's a senior, you go higher than them. Like Leanne said, she she didn't go to a manager because the manager was a source of problems. So she went above to the matrons. So there's always a hierarchy, even on a Saturday or a Sunday. There's always one. So, um, so Claire, I think. Um Obviously, you work um, in GPN land, but um, and as a lecturer now, sorry to disregard that. But uh, it, there's one about community, and maybe you could shed some light. Um, so, um, and Lisa as well, if you want to chime in on this as well. So, there's one about wanting to join community nursing, um, but they are wondering why you left community and went into ITU. But just to bracket that with another question is how long before going out on solo visits and um, was it whilst working in the community? Do you want me to take that first Claire and then you can pick up anything after? Because um, yeah. I know GPN, GPN whilst it has similar crossover she's more based in it, in it so um, I, I didn't have anything wrong community I just wanted to challenge myself so it wasn't anything that was wrong I still do bank shifts on the odd occasion with the same trust um, I have no issues of it. Um, go into community. People will always tell you, do not go, do not go. It should, it should be like when you're thinking about retiring, which I don't agree with, the amount of legs I've had to pick up and whatnot. I wouldn't want somebody who has back problems um, or is approaching time where your back does start to, you know, go a little, to start picking up legs and all sorts. No. Um, and as someone who had a knee problem, that would sometimes affect my work and how I worked. So, um, yeah, I, like I said in the beginning, if you want to go somewhere, go there. Don't let anyone's opinion kind of sway you. Some people will tell you, oh, this specific job is rubbish or, um, oh, I've been there and it's not great. But people have different experiences. I mean, for example, like me with ITU, I don't like ITU. I gave it six months. It wasn't for me and that is why I'm going. Um, but other people are like, oh no, it's so great. Why are you leaving? Why are you giving aren't you giving it longer? I'm like, well, I gave it six months, and admittedly, some of the time I was off sick, but I go I went back and then I went off sick again because the workplace was not for me. Um, which I'll kind of elaborate on the mental health bit. So we'll probably just kind of wrap the questions up in about a couple of minutes. But um it wasn't I'd say after two weeks I started going off by myself doing insulin and proper visits probably after a month but that was because of how mine was going this is when you ask um and set out like what you are planning to do you, you, they shouldn't throw you into the deep end on your first day they should have a plan of what they want you to do yeah 
same in GP. So there should be a plan. You should be super numery for two weeks, hopefully, uh, or longer if, if you're not comfortable or confident. Um, and I love GP. The only reason I left and went to lecturing is because I really love teaching and I, I'm so passionate about helping students and I really miss that. And because as a, as a student, I used to help students. It's weird because I used to do mentoring and stuff like that as a student nurse and um, do little talks and things like that at you. And I really missed it. Um, and I didn't see any students as a, GP, as a GP nurse, but for whatever reason, we just didn't have any at the time. Um, so I really missed that. So when I saw the job coming up uh, at the university that I was a student at, I was like, yes, I'm applying. I'm there. <laughs> um just because I'm, i was just really passionate i'm still on a no percent contract at the gp practice but i have to be honest i haven't done many uh gp shifts since i left um but yeah that's all i love gp i still love gp i still promote gp and you can absolutely be a new newly newly registered gp nurse don't be afraid go for it yes you can and again, from a community learning disability, just to chip in, sorry, you know, I, I do community LD, which I went straight into, which again, you're not meant to. But um, initially we did a lot of, I did a lot of joint visits for going with other people who were more experienced on visits. And then after probably about a month, started doing some of my own visits. But again, it was planned out ones that weren't likely to be massively um, problematic and kind of staggering up as we went along. We are running out of time, so if we haven't had a chance to read your question, um, feel free to, uh, we, we can also address these on our uh, curating website um, on Twitter as well, so we can also post these questions. So if you want to continue adding, that's absolutely fine. Um, but there are a few that I'd like to talk about, which is about um, jobs themselves. So there's a lot of people talking about um, if it's okay, so one of them is, is finding a newly qualified position outside of your host trust as a student difficult or if, if there's considerations that they should have. Um, and I know as myself, I am moving away from my trust and moving out of the city. So um, and I know a lot of you guys have as well. So I think that's a good place. And that also wraps up some of the other questions that are around um, moving trusts and moving departments. But I found it really easy, like I didn't find any challenges or struggles. Um, and I think especially now with the staff shortages and everything, I think everyone will just snap you up anyway, wherever you want to go. <laughs> yeah, I agree. It's the same with me. I've not had any problem moving from trust. Like I said, I'm on my third job in a year. No one's ever said anything negative about it because I've always explained why I wanted to go. So um, you don't actually have to do that. Um, I said in my ITU interview, I was actually looking to go into the hospital and challenge myself. I said in my hospice interview, do you know what? ITU wasn't for me. I'm fine with that. And my end goal was to be a palliative care specialist nurse anyway. And being in hospice is probably going to be my faster way of getting there than waiting two years to get experience in a hospital. Um, I actually started outside of my host trust. I um, was in a hospital host trust, so I ended up coming to a community trust near me because it was close by. I had no problems. If you're looking on the NHS website, you'll find things. They are more than happy to take people away from um, uh, their host trust. Trust me, they want them because if there's vacancies, they want to fill them. Um, and they will usually provide the good education training um, stuff and they will sell it to you as well. They won't just leave it. And um, I remember seeing something about like, isn't a job interview supposed to be about selling yourself? Well, yeah and no, because also they should be selling them to you, themselves to you too. Um, all of my interviews have kind of said all the benefits about going there, um, what kind of education support I will get. And uh, the same way I have told them what they will get from me. So. I'm really sorry to those that their questions weren't answered. As I said, we will take them forward. Um, and um, yeah, a, a lot. I think a lot of the questions were answered in a really beautiful way. So thanks, guys. Um, but Lisa, I'm going to hand over back to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I've got a couple of slides. It's just about mental health and well-being on this one, financial support on the next, and then I'll close the webinar. Um, mental health and well-being is incredibly important. Um, throughout your journey because as a student nurse you can still have those difficult um, periods of mental health and well, um, well-being issues. Um, I'm a great example of that as somebody who's had anxiety, well diagnosed anxiety since 2015 and it got worse over Covid so now I have generalised anxiety where I'm just anxious about everything these days um, and I am very good at masking it if you can't tell. Um, I, I, on the slide, it tells you the types of things you can be doing, talking to your friends, family or colleagues. And if you don't find, if you don't think that's comfortable, if you think, oh, do you know what, I don't want to burden my family or do you know what, I don't like my colleagues enough to say anything. 
um, you can go to your GP, um, you can seek um, Samaritans is another good one actually, um, we don't have Samaritans on there but um, that's a good general one to contact if they will take calls from anyone and anything and frontline, um, you can text frontline or call them, um, that's more of a um, NHS specific one, we've got the nurse lifeline too which is more specifically for nursing um, and a lot of these have actually come out from COVID so it's sad that it's taken a global pandemic for a lot of these services to be set up so um, take time to do things for yourself um, if you're working in a hospital you're most certainly working three to four days and you'll find your off days you don't want to do anything or at least that's how I feel um, so I try and do things that I like um, go out for walks, go to the gym. If you don't like the gym, that's fine. Go outside walking. I mean, it's free and sometimes you get some really nice um, views. Or even when you're living in London like me, um, you do get it. Um, you can write things down, diary, email yourself. If you write a letter and never send it, burn it. Do what, well, obviously safely, please, if you're going to burn it. Um, most, most, if not all trusts, and um, if you're not working in a trust, um, say so charity, university, it depends on where you go, they will all have something um, called occupational health which is more formalised support but they should all also have um, support lines, I can't remember what they're called off the top of my head right now, um, they usually signpost you, they're like oh here's this number or here's this website and you can get free advice and whatnot. Um, I'm sure I'll remember the name when I've gone, so that's that's quite funny. Um, and the RCN are a good support as well. They don't just do the union side of things, they do extra bits as well. So if you look on the website, they tell you all the things you can get advice and support from too. And I think we'll go to the next slide, please. Um, financial support is another big one. Um, when you transition from student to paid member of staff, um, you're, you're actually going from having your student loans three times a year to your money once a month. And whilst everyone thinks that's great, um, because to be honest as soon as I got mine I was like yes sometimes you might actually be waiting slightly longer depending when you join in the month um as the side rightly says your first um, wage might start with taking some things off so say for example you had some universities will take loan let you have little small loans that you might have to pay back or your family or friends may have lent you some money um and you're like oh no I've got, now I've got to pay them because I've got this massive bit of money some have wage streams, some don't, and wage stream will let you access a percentage of your um, wage. I can't remember what the percentage is, I think it depends on your trust. Um, the RCN also offer hardship grants um, through the foundation, which um, I've had to apply for myself as I've recently gone part time and that has taken a huge kind of knock on effect for me on both my mental health and my financial health. Um, so I've done that. Um, I, I can't tell you how it all works, I've only filled out the form today because I finally got around to doing it. Um, they do have criteria, so it has, you have to be an NMC registered nurse or midwife who lives in the UK or the Channel Islands, um, but you can have qualified abroad, so uh, that's not, so if, if you're an internationally educated nurse that doesn't rule you out. If you're a healthcare support worker or a midwifery support worker, nursing associate or an apprentice, um, and you've practiced for three or more years, um, you can also apply. Um, if you're retired off sick, which the retired ones really apply here, but the off sick can, even though you're in a role, but I'd say more likely for those who are undergraduate students. If your funding is stopped because of illness, or you're fleeing from domestic abuse, or have had bereavement of a partner that you lived with, you can actually get in contact with the foundation to discuss your specific case. And then I will move on to the final slide, please. Um, thank you so much for joining the webinar this evening. That's both to our lovely two guests, Leanne and Claire, and to the rest of the team who we've just given up our time to come and join you. Um, and I'm thank you, thank you to you all for submitting your questions. Um, and just I hope we've even alleviated some of your worries. If you feel like we haven't answered your question or you want to find out more, you can contact us on RCNNRN over on Twitter. Or you can actually get in contact with Leanne. Um, her Instagram is Nursing with Strength. Or you can get in contact with Claire, which is Claire, well, sorry, C Carmichael underscore 83. I don't think she's changed it yet. Um, and then if you want to get involved um, with the NRN network, if you are in your last, I think we're, we're going from your last six months at the moment. We did have three months, but we've gone to six months. You can get involved, DM us on Twitter or just have a look at our network page. Um, and we take anyone up to, I'd say about a year, um, post qualified because we all start changing and going from about 18 months to two years. So thank you very much for joining us.
Lisa, two seconds, because we've also had a lot of people in the chat just say thank you to everybody on this call. So I'd like to just share that with you all as a final thing, is that everybody is saying thank you so much for sharing your time and sharing your stories. Um, and it's been really interesting and helpful. Um, and also, um, yeah, just generally like thank you. Thank you for sharing with everybody. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing.